This is Diedrich Stoppel. I've never met him, but people I know who have tell me that he's quite tall and highly charismatic. At one point 15 years ago or so, he was one of the top stars in my field of social psychology. He was known for clever experiments, such as showing that people tested in filthy environments, rather than clean ones, were more likely to express prejudice. One of his papers was published in Science, one of the top two scientific journals. Awarded his PhD in 1997, just over a decade later, Stoppel was already a professor and dean at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. He had won awards for his work and was regularly featured on Dutch TV shows, where he would share his keen intellect as one of the top Dutch intellectuals. He received multiple research grants and was highly sought after as a conference guest speaker. And then everything started falling apart in 2011. An investigation was begun at the three universities where he had worked, and they found several instances of him engaging in scientific fraud. A year later, he was out of work, and eventually, 58 of his research papers, including his paper in science, were retracted. In this video, I want to make you aware that science isn't always the perfect objective system of checks and balances, that it's sometimes polluted by scientific fraud, where data, analyses, conclusions, and even research participants have been created out of thin air. They simply don't exist. I want to talk about its prevalence in science and why it happens. And I'll end the video with hopeful signs that a growing number of people are doing something to eliminate it. But first, a couple more high-profile examples. This is Woo Suk Hwang, a biology professor at Seoul National University in Korea. In 2004, he announced in Science, that same journal where Stoppel had published, that he had successfully cloned human embryos. He followed this up with another article in Science a year later. This research had profound implications. Such cloning would allow for personalized stem cell treatments and thus help recover damaged tissue or diseased organs. Huang had already been doing this sort of research since the late 90s, but that had been done with cows and pigs. This work in 2004 and 2005 was done with human cells and was thus heralded it as a breakthrough. He became world famous. In his home country, posters appeared on public transport with his picture and the title Hope of the World, Dream of Korea. Korea even issued a postage stamp in 2005 to celebrate his accomplishments. More money was given to him for his research. Hundreds of women volunteered to donate their eggs. Huang was appointed to head the new World Stem Cell Hub, a facility to be the world's leading stem cell research center, and it looked like his future was limitless. But within a year, everything came crashing down. Investigations showed that not only had he obtained his initial batch of human eggs from his own students and sex workers without telling them what they would be used for, but the data in the studies themselves were completely made up. When the news media started reporting these investigations, which clearly showed a massive amount of scientific fraud, his supporters gathered in the streets of Seoul to start protesting outside the offices of the media organizations making the reports. People were so pro Huang that they just couldn't believe their beloved hero could have been so fraudulent. But he was. He was eventually fired from his university and then criminally charged with embezzlement, but managed to avoid jail with a two-year suspended sentence. As of today, he is still working at a private bioengineering institute in Korea, although he's back to work with stem cells of pig embryos. And finally, here's Mark Tessier Levine, who until July of this year was the president of Stanford University, clearly one of the leading research universities in the world. He's a Canadian by birth who later attended Oxford and University College London, where he received his doctorate in physiology in 1987. He became a leading neuroscientist, studying the brain cells that trigger Alzheimer's disease, leading to more prestige, research dollars, and publications in top scientific journals. After spending some time at Rockefeller University, Stanford, and the private firm Genentech, Stanford announced in 2016 that he would become their next university president. That same year, he was awarded Officer of the Order of Canada, one of that nation's highest honors. But all of this success has come crashing down too. 
A first-year student at Stanford, Theo Baker, who was a reporter at the Stanford Daily, the student newspaper, had read an anonymous comment at Pub Peer, an online forum where science papers are discussed. In it is said, this highly cited science paper is riddled with problematic blot images. That anonymous 2015 observation helped spark a chain of events that led Stanford's president, Mark Tessier Levine, to resign this month. And yes, again, that prestigious journal Science was involved. The students' reporting and other complaints triggered a full university investigation. In the past few months, the university released its report and found no evidence of direct data manipulation by Tessier Levine. However, five of his papers were still questionable and would be retracted. Theo Baker just wrote about this in the New York Times, showing how some images of data from these studies were fabricated. Even if Tessier Levine didn't do it himself, the argument went, he was still the head of the laboratory where the apparently fraudulent research happened. Tessier Levine has yet to admit any real wrongdoing, but has stepped down as president and will remain on the faculty as a professor in biology. Okay, there you have it three famous cases of scientific fraud. There are so many more that I could tell you about from other parts of the world and involving other scientific fields. In fact, the case of Diederik Stoppel in my field was preceded 10 years before by a young academic, Karen Ruggiero. Ruggiero had been an assistant professor at Harvard for four years before moving to the University of Texas at Austin in 2000. She was soon found out to have fabricated data in two large studies and eventually admitted that she did not run 600 subjects who data were reported in two papers and had been supported by federal research grants. In the end, four of her papers were retracted and she was dismissed from UT Austin. Now, Stuart Ritchie has written this wonderful book, Science Fictions, Exposing Fraud, Bias, Negligence, and Hype in Science, that I highly recommend to you. I'll leave a link in the description below. In it, he talks about cases like this in detail, and he points out three big problems with scientific fraud in particular. One, it hurts the morale of scientists and makes us waste time and money. Two, it makes everyone feel a little distrusting of the scientific literature. And three, it can have a negative impact on treatment. People can die based on fraudulent results like this. But perhaps you'll argue that this is all very rare and I'm making a mountain out of a molehill. Well, I wish this was true. Ritchie talks about the prevalence of fraud in his book. In one study in the field of cell biology, for example, an analysis of papers from one cell biology journal found that 6.1% of the images, like those used in the Stanford president's research, were problematic. Further, this analysis showed that researchers with problematic images had other publications with faked images 40% of the time. Thousands of papers in this field alone were estimated to have this problem. Another way to measure fraud is through retractions, when a journal is requested to retract a published paper by the authors or those who've complained about the research. Some of these papers are retracted for honest reasons. For example, someone found that they entered the wrong number while performing some calculations, and the error is only discovered after the paper appeared in print. It's been estimated by researchers looking into this that perhaps only four in 10,000 published studies are retracted for any of these reasons, including fraud. However, remember that some of these famous cases that I began the video with didn't involve any retractions until many years later, only after some external investigation took place. Another way to look at the incidence of fraud is to survey scientists anonymously. When asked in one of the largest surveys ever done on this, almost 2% of scientists admitted to faking their data at least once. That's one in 50 scientists admitting fraud for which they haven't been discovered. And in other research that asked scientists how many other scientists that they knew had falsified data, the figure jumped to 14.1%. This is an interesting number because we know from social psychology research that people are less likely to admit to their own embarrassing or immoral behaviors, but are likely to overestimate them in others especially if they do those behaviors themselves. So perhaps the true fraud rate is between 2% and 14%.
Why is there so much fraud? Well, obviously you can point to corrupt, broken people who ruin it for the rest of us. This is a similar argument to the one that a small number of criminals commit a disproportionate number of crimes. Indeed, according to Ritchie, the Retraction Watch database shows that just 2% of individual scientists are responsible for 25% of all retractions. But as a good social psychologist, I have to point out that blaming individual traits for all this bad behavior is committing the fundamental attribution error. We have a tendency to underestimate the power of the situation in explaining people's behaviors. How could situational pressures explain scientific fraud? Well, it's easy to imagine how the pressures of the up-and-coming researcher who may be struggling to secure permanent work to publish splashy findings that get them into the best science journals. Postdoctoral positions, grants and fellowships, and permanent employment all depend on the scientist's track record. And if you know that people are doing a little cheating here and there to get their papers published, maybe they hide their negative results and only report their positive findings, for example, you might decide the only way to compete in this unfair system is to cheat too. Stoppel, for example, talked about this in his Tell All Confessional book. It started with a few bits of data manipulation here and there to make his results tidier and easier for the journal editors to understand. He was rewarded with these little changes to his data with publication in the best journals. It wasn't long before he realized he could streamline the process by skipping the messiness of data collection altogether to create more beautiful data sets and thus reap the rewards. Our scientific fields and universities love those top researchers with their brilliant data sets. They bring honor and publicity to their institutions. Universities compete with one another in league tables that showcase how truly they are a top research university in the world by measuring the publications of their academic staff. Thus, incentives abound to be successful one way or the other. Failing to publish your papers might mean you won't be promoted or hired. And then, once you are in the enviable spot of being a renowned scientist in your field, you might even want more. More power more money, more influence. The temptations to cheat are still there. It happens in business, politics, sports, and the arts. Why wouldn't it happen in science too? Of course, the vast majority of scientists conduct their research with integrity and adhere to ethical standards. Most science is done without the slightest touch of fraud or bad practices. That's important to remember. So what can we do about the fraud though? It depends so much on trust, doesn't it? So much of science is done in private, in quiet labs with few people around. How could we really police it? And in fact, none of the people I've mentioned who committed scientific fraud have even served time in jail. The worst that seems to happen is that they may lose their job and have their reputation tarnished, but they eventually land on their feet doing something else. Perhaps the potential benefits of fraud, prestige, research money, top university jobs, far outweigh the costs of being found out. And you can see from the real life examples I've mentioned so far, the most prestigious journals publish fraudulent data, and many institutions are loath to bring down their top stars in research. I'll end this video by just pointing out that fraud can be considered to be an endpoint on a continuum of research practices that range from out and out data fakery to questionable research practices, like deleting data that don't fit with your hypotheses or changing the hypotheses to match what you found. I talk about these QRPs in this video, which you'll want to watch next, especially if you're in psychology. There are many good people working these days on ways to eliminate these bad practices, but obviously bad science is still around. With such high stakes in research in academia, where so much emphasis is placed on getting those grant dollars and publishing in the best journals, there will be many incentives to cheat. Perhaps if only there were a massive overhaul of all those incentives, we would see fraud eliminated. But that's never going to happen, is it? Therefore, I'm not sure we can really eliminate all this fraud. What do you think? Please leave me a comment below. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay curious. Bye.